Hi everyone, welcome back. We are recording our 10th episode from the Wash U Division of Nephrology. My name is Timothy Yao. Uh, welcome to uh, the Nephrology Web Episodes. Uh, so I had a lupus case ready to present and I realized that it would probably be worthwhile to uh, give a discussion of lupus before we actually jump into um, the complexities of, of, of lupus nephritis. Uh, so I'm going to start kind of uh, with a primer on classification and we're going to discuss some of the active and chronic um, histologic findings that make lupus nephritis um, uh, what it is. So we're going to start with the case. It's pretty straightforward. A 27-year-old African-American female diagnosed with lupus about eight months ago based on joint pains, rash, after an initial prednisone um, course and then taper, she's maintained on Plaquenil monotherapy and is asymptomatic. She's referred to nephrology when the initial routine urine testing revealed 1 plus protein and 1 plus blood. 24-hour quantification of this revealed 600 milligrams per day and her serum creatinine is 0.8. So she has preserved renal function, non-nephrotic range proteinuria, but if you ask most nephrologists, should this patient get a biopsy, the answer hopefully would universally be yes, she needs a biopsy. She is only on Plaquenil, uh, which is not sufficient for treatment of lupus nephritis if she does indeed have that. Uh, and we are notoriously poor at trying to predict if a patient would have class 3 or class 4 disease based solely on um, factors such as the proteinuria or the creatinine. So this patient very well may have very active lupus. Um, so we're going to discuss a little bit about the classifications that have evolved over the years. Um, in the 70s, the WHO classification was the original. Uh, this is what I was taught when I was a medical student when we discussed lupus nephritis. So you have class 1, which is normal, class 2, which is pure mesangial disease, class 3 is a focal, segmental, proliferative glomerulonephritis. Class 4 was your diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, and class 5 was membranous. Um, so it's important to understand what these words mean. So focal and segmental obviously just mean, the, the segmental portion means it's not involving all of the glomerulus, uh, it's just a portion of the glomerulus. And the focal implies that it does not affect all glomeruli. So focal and diffuse are kind of opposites. Uh, this was modified slightly in the 80s. Uh, they kind of added this class 6 of advanced sclerosis, which is just kind of end-stage kidney. And they kind of made a few clarifications. Class 1 was normal, although you can still see deposits on IF or EM. Um, and they kind of expanded on what they meant by focal and segmental, was that these were active necrotizing lesions or chronic sclerosing lesions. So this was the uh, classification that kind of was in place for the next 20 or so years. Uh, a lot of lupus trials were done during this time course, classifying patients as three, four, or five, as those are typically the classes of lupus that warrant more aggressive treatment than simple ACE inhibition. Then in um, 2004 came the ISN and RPS classification. And if you just look at it like this, you say, oh, well, it's not much different. They still have, you know, class 1 being normal, class 2 being mesangial, class 3 being focal, 4 being diffuse, 5 being membranous, and 6 being sclerosing or advanced, you know, chronic disease. But if you actually take a close look at 3 and 4, this uh, IS and RPS classification made a big difference in the way we classify some forms of lupus. Um, because they expanded on what they meant by focal and diffuse, and they made very strict criteria for these. So when they talk about focal disease, they, s they make the cutoff that this involves less than 50% of the glomeruli sampled. And then they subclassify these focal lesions into active, so that'd be a 3A, or chronic, which would be 3C, or a combination of active and chronic lesions, which would be a 3AC. Diffuse, um, again, means all glomeruli, but in this classification, diffuse involves, means that whatever lesion is present involves greater than 50% of the glomeruli sampled. And we'll talk about why this makes a difference. Uh, same breakdown, they, they, they broke it down into active, 
chronic lesions for both um, the active segmental or active global. So an active, a 4SA would be an active lesion, like I'm going to show you in the next slide, which is segmental, but involves more than 50% of the glomeruli. So why is this important? So let's say you had this finding on the kidney biopsy of the case that I presented above, um, which is actually quite possible. Um, again, uh, we are not very good at predicting lupus nephritis uh, classification. So what we see here is a large cellular crescent, which is leading to destruction of this entire glomerulus within Bowman's space. And immunofluorescence, let's assume, is negative. Again, this is commonly seen. Other disease where this would commonly be seen would be the vasculitides. Um, and although it would be unusual to have a normal serum creatinine with this patient, uh, you could have more than 50% of the glomeruli sampled involved, which would then put this patient into a 4G, uh, or sorry, 4S, 4S, I even made a mistake as I was doing it. 4S, so it's a class 4, it involves greater than 50% of glomerulus. It's an S, which is a segmental lesion, and it's an A, which is an active lesion. So, again, why does this matter? So I'm going to bring this up. Um, so, first of all, a shout out to Rush Medical Center, where I trained up in Chicago, which uh, is the home of Ed Lewis and the Collaborative Study Group. And they taught me a lot about lupus nephritis, and this is an important point, which is commonly missed uh, with the change in the classification from the WHO to the ISNRPS. So on this right hand side you have the old WHO4 and on the left hand side the circle would be the old WHO3. And with the difference in um, classification between the WHO and now the ISNRPS, there are several patients who used to be a class 3 lesion who had focal segmental lesions, but now because of this greater than 50% glomeruli involved, would transition from a prior WHO3 into this overlapping section, which would now be a 4. And so they have labeled this kind of 4Q, like question, what should you classify these patients as? And so again, when you talk about treatment um, trials for lupus, be it you know, cyclophosphamide or Celsept or, or rituxin or what have you, they usually just kind of lump all the threes and the fours um, uh, and then some overlap with the fives as well. But uh, a lot of these, these patients would do really poorly. If you imagine if you had a vasculitis patient who had a segmental um, crescent and it was affecting more than 50% of the glomeruli, that would be crescentic glomerulonephritis. Um, but if you were to classify those patients who had those findings in the setting of lupus, they would just be class 4 lupus. All right, so we're going to talk about what makes an active lesion and what makes a chronic lesion. So there are a lot of things that make active lesions. You can have straightforward cellular proliferation. You can have disruption of the capillary loop. Again, that rupture of the capillary loop from immune complexes depositing there or from a posse immune process would lead to crescents. Carirexis crescents, wire loops, I'm going to show you an example of these, but that's essentially just uh, massive subendothelial deposits. Hyaline thrombi, that's actual deposits of antigen antibody complexes that are typically seen within the capillary loop. Fibrin thrombi, again, uh, cellular debris from fibrinoid necrosis that are um, plugging up the capillary loop. And then you can have segmental necrotizing lesions. So all of these would count as active lesions. Uh, chronic lesions would be glomerulosclerosis, fibrous crescents, and the ever-present tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. So I'm going to show you a couple pictures of some of these. So here is a, a low-power H&E um, of a very nice core of a patient with lupus. You can see um, that uh, the tubular interstitium is relatively well preserved here. And even at this low power, although you can't make out the specifics, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six glomeruli, at least in this field. And there is some active diffuse global process occurring. You know, there's way too many cells. 
Um, so this would be a 4G. And if you look closer at the sclerenoli, you can see that there's massive mesangial hypercellularity, there's endocapillary proliferation, and this process is not only affecting 100% of the glomerulus, which makes it a global lesion, but is also affecting 100% of the glomeruli sampled, which would make it a diffuse lesion. Here's a more subtle uh, finding, although still abnormal. Uh, and you can see you have these capillary loops on the periphery. Some of these capillary loops are pretty normal, but you have these loops on the periphery which are very prominent. And so this is uh, what we call wire loops. And these are active lesions in lupus. And what these loops actually represent, which I'm gonna show you in this next EM picture, is actually a massive subendothelial deposit. So here on the outside is the basement membrane. Here's your podocyte and your uh, urine space. And you can see this dark material, which is just enveloping the entire capillary loop, is what is uh, seen as a wire loop on the light microscopy. You can also see in this picture, you know, this is the capillary loop, which normally is white and wide open, but there is proliferation in a lot of cells within this area. So this is the EM image of what would be called endocapillary proliferation. Here is a, another glomerulus. Um, so most of these images, I should have told you, are taken from uh, Hepton stalls. Um, that's a, you know, the Bible of renal pathology. I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to learn more about it. Um, so this is an image of a glomerulus, and you can see within the capillary loops there's some pink stuff, some hyaline material. So these are hyaline thrombi that are plugging up the capillary loop. Again, that is simply antigen-antibody complexes uh, that are plugging it up. And these would stain uh, positive on immunofluorescence. Here's a silver stain of a segmental necrotizing lesion. And it should be pretty obvious that this is the lesion that we're talking about. So the remainder of the glomerulus, you know, from say three o'clock to 12 o'clock, is pretty normal that you have this segmental necrotizing lesion here. Here's an eight, uh, sorry, a PAS, uh, I almost said H&E, and then I realized that you could see the brush border of the tubule here, which makes it a PAS. So it's a PAS of a glomerulus, um, and you can see here significant mesangial hypercellularity. Um, there's also maybe a little bit of endocapillary proliferation here and here, uh, although we'd have to look at more glomeruli, but there's prominent mesangial hypercellularity as, as can be uh, visualized right here. Here's the image that we had from before. Again, massive cellular crescent, um, just obliterating this glomerulus. And don't forget about this. Again, um, a PAS, and uh, the PAS tends to stain the basement membrane in the capillary loop quite well. And if you just look at the capillary loops in the basement membrane in this image, they appear very prominent. Another word that sometimes has been used to describe these capillary loops is stiff or proud appearing capillary loops. Um, and again, if you see this, you would suspect something uh, like membranous, which again, can be seen in lupus. It's our class five of lupus. Uh, the silver stain may show some spikes or holes. Uh, and how do you differentiate, you know, membranous lupus from idiopathic membranous? Well, everyone talks about, you know, the antiphospholipase uh, A2 receptor antibody, which is gonna revolutionize, I think, testing for membranous, but a simple way for lupus is that membranous, idiopathic membranous, should only stain positive for IgG, whereas lupus nephritis membranous, class five, will be pan positive for IgG, IgA, IgM, C1, C3. Uh, so that's why we call it, you know, the full house appearance because you'll have three of a kind for the immunoglobulins, and then you'll have a pair of the complements, so that's the full house. 
lastly, um, if you zoom in very closely to some of the immune complexes in lupus, you can actually see a distinct substructure. So we, we oftentimes talk about the substructural appearance of immune complex deposits when we discuss diseases such as amyloidosis or immunotactoid glomerulopathy or fibrillary GN. But lupus is one of those diseases that can also have this distinct substructure. This is called thumbprinting. Um, and other diseases can cause us to cryoglobulinemia and so forth. But uh, you should not be surprised when you see uh, a high power view of EM with this distinct substructure. Uh, lupus should be on the differential in addition to all of those diseases such as amyloid, uh, immune tactoid, fibrillary, etc. So that's a quick primer on the classification and the uh, active and chronic lesions for lupus. Um, I will eventually present a case. Uh, I wanted to kind of give this primer because lupus is such a challenging thing, uh, not only for renal fellows, but even for nephropathologists uh, to classify. And I think it's important to understand uh, kind of the history of the classifications as we've gone through um, the last 30 or 40 years of this disease. Um, so I want to again thank you everyone who uh, has subscribed to this web series. I will continue to produce monthly content. Um, I will be coming back with some really neat pathology cases in the next few months. Uh, hopefully one of them will be a lupus case where you can apply what I talk, um, discussed here. Uh, if you have suggestions, feel free to email me, yatt at wustel.edu. You can follow our channel on YouTube at WashU Nephrology, and you can tweet at me on Twitter at maximal underscore change. Thanks again for tuning in. See you next month.